while we're waiting, if you had any questions on the previous lecture, please post them in the chat. There were some questions on Piazza. I'll go over them briefly today. Uh, but if you had any other questions, please post it here. Okay, let's start. Um, as usual, if you can turn on your camera, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, so today the topic we're gonna have is called prefetching. So we're essentially gonna continue on the topic of memory optimization. Last time I was showing you how to reduce the number of misses into caches. So that would decrease the latency of memory accesses, obviously. Today, we're gonna try something different. Today, we're gonna try not to reduce the number of misses, we'll try to reduce the average latency. We'll try to overlap the latency. This is called prefetch, okay? Uh, before we start over that, a uh, few things. So there won't be a lecture on April 5th. I will be involved in MLC 2020, uh, 2021 conference, even though it's everything is virtual right now, I still has to, you know, involved in several meetings there. So it overlaps with our lectures. So I think it's okay, we'll skip it. So we'll let you spend some time on preparing for the final exam. Um, so that's on April 5th. Any questions about that? So just a heads up. So there won't be a class on April 5th. Okay. Then, uh, before we go over uh, uh, this topic, there were several posts on Piazza that uh, were responded, but I want to make sure that everyone, you know, not have any other similar confusion. So first of all, there was one question about register location. Someone asked a question along the lines, can I don't do a fancy register location, but do just do some random assignments or is the compiler can ever avoid register allocation completely? The short answer is that there is no shortcut here completely. You can use trivial register allocation algorithm, but you cannot avoid it fully. Why is that? So the person suggests, can we just randomly assign registers? Well, the problem with that, even though you can have whatever freedom you want with assigning the register, you need to respect the dependency. So you cannot completely randomly assign registers, right? that would cause broken dependencies, right? Because it still needs to reflect what's written in the code, which brings you back to say, what is the simplest possible uh, register allocation algorithm I can have? 
The answer to that is the linear algorithm that's as easy as it can be. So at least you need to make a linear pass through all the code and the most trivial algorithm I can think of because you can't beat linear. You need to see the line of code at least once, right? So you need to go through the code at least once. And as you go, you assign uh, everything that's needed in your registry, you assign a new registry, right? You don't go deeper, don't reassign things, don't try to color. Essentially, you just have, there is a dependency here, I respect it, it's used the same register. If there is uh, no dependency, I give it in, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever first free register, right, essentially. And then if I'm at, out of register, I start to do spill fills, right? This is as easy as it can be, it's linear. I've seen it being used in some complicated cases where nothing else worked. Um, but even that is still a register allocation algorithm. So the Schwann's answer to that, you can make simpler algorithm than what we did. Um, they had to be at least linear, but there is no way you don't have it because someone has to assign the registers. So these two things, instruction scheduling and register allocation has to happen, right? Those two, it's mandatory optimizations in a sense, right? Those two passes should be always there. Any questions about register allocation? So this is why it's important, why it has a dedicated lecture, why that's why people are still working on it. Any questions about that in general? Okay. Another question was about the lecture last time where someone was confused about how I iterate over the arrays because they said, well, that, that mismatches with how the memory is allocated. On one of the slides, I specifically highlight that the iteration space, how we go over the data, doesn't necessarily match how the data is allocated. Allocation is an artifact of the programming language you use and the compiler that has certain conventions like row order versus column order, and it's not one fixed thing. While the iteration space is something on how you change your code, right? So you can change the way you go. So there, the loop might be going over the array in one direction, right? And you can change it, right? You, I show you that you can reorder loop iterations, you can do loop tiling, a lot of other optimizations, right? So remember how the data is placed in memory versus how you go over that, it's two different things that doesn't have necessarily to be the same. And a compiler has the freedom to change the order of execution, right? As soon as it's correct. So remember, even though as an algorithm writer, you might expect things go in a certain way, if you don't have any dependencies, your assumptions about how things are executed can be different from reality. Like for example, it can be parallelized. So you might write a loop and think that everything is executed sequentially, but actually compiler might take the loop and parallelize it using something like OpenMP and different pieces of your loop might be actually executed on different threads and things like that. So this is all outside of your control. That's what compiler does. If it make something bad for you, uh, if you understand the compiler well, you can disable these optimizations, right? But I'm just saying your straightforward naive sequential assumption how the iterations of the loop execute might not be true after compiler works, right? So don't make that assumption. It's especially important to understand if you try to do debugging because you might think when you debug things, I'm gonna do step-by-step -step in loop and then you will be very surprised how things execute very differently, right? If you want to avoid that problem, you would need to build uh, essentially uh, uh, your code with like O0 so that most of the optimizations are disabled. Okay, any questions about that? Uh, that thing about iteration space versus data space is very important. So I want you guys to understand it. And if you're not sure about it, please ask questions because it's really fundamental for, the, for today's lecture as well. This is something we're gonna you know, play with. Questions? Okay, are there any other questions that you guys want to ask? Don't be shy. So if there's anything that's confusing from the previous lectures. Okay, if there is no problem uh, with any of this prior lectures, okay, you can always ask me, as you know, on Piazza, like all these questions were given, all the answers were given on Piazza as well, just want to highlight it a little bit. So Let's talk about the memory latency then and how we can deal with this problem. First of all, I'll show you a trend on how the DRAM-based memory evolve over time. And one, why I focus on DRAM-based memory because that's a primary uh, technology still to this day that we use for, for memory, right? 
there are some alternatives that people are working on, but that's pretty much the, the most important ones. So what I'm going to show here on this graph, I'm going to show you a trend, right? As we're going from 1999, right? Like more than 20 years ago, um, roughly up to 2017, this is when this graph was produced. And it's in logarithmic scale, right? An exponential scale, essentially, right? This is DRAM, DRAM improvement over time. So this is 10x, this is 100x, right? So a linear line here means exponential improvement so that you understand, okay? And I'm gonna show you a few different magic characteristics of DRAM, capacity, bandwidth, and latency. So how big we are, how fast, uh, how fast we are in terms of bandwidth, and what is our latency. As you can see here, from here until here, we pretty much were exponentially increasing the capacity of DRAM, right? We were pretty much doubled every like four years, uh, if more than doubled between the different generations of DRAM. So it was an exponential trend here, a certain factor, right? Pretty much DRAM manufacturers, and this is why DRAM was so attractive, right? It has a lot of resources for easy scaling because the main reason we use memory because we need a lot of it, right? Like we don't have enough SRAM. So capacity E was one of the major factors. As you can see here, eventually things starts to, you know, slow down, but not completely. So just that you see here, there's more details number. So like from 2014 to 15, it was plain, but then it's still improvement and so on. So uh, capacity still grows. Although one of the reasons capacity starts to slow down over time is actually related to bandwidth and latency. So, but does the improvement of capacity was the same as was in bandwidth? As you can see, it's not. So it turns out that giving higher capacity is an easier problem than giving more bandwidth. If you look at this graph, then the bandwidth improvement over time doesn't look as nice as capacity, right? So we were getting more and more memory, but we cannot supply it with more bandwidth, right? That means that if I had, uh, you know, very bandwidth intensive application, something like modern GPUs, graphic applications or machine learning, they can start for bandwidth, right, easily because they're not latency sensitive, but they're bandwidth sensitive. They want to read a lot of data in parallel. That's what your you know, 4K monitor wants to do, right? And that's why they're, the bandwidth is so critical. This is why the hardware for those applications, uh, accelerators for those applications are actually built with a very high bandwidth memory. This is regular DRAM, but there's specialized DRAM as well. You can see it's still going relatively nicely, going up, but not as impressive as bandwidth. So who could go? try to guess how the latencies graph is going to look over that time? So capacity was improving, bandwidth was improving. So what happens with latency? Any guesses? Stay the same for most of the time. Yeah, it pretty much didn't improve, right? So improvement and latency are just a joke. So what does this mean? I get a lot of memory with some improvements in bandwidth and literally no improvement over time with latency. What does it mean? It means that over time, the memory latency becomes bigger and bigger and bigger problem. So that means that I can't really supply it at a very low latency, right? So essentially the processor speed over that time, right? Was also going up pretty much exponentially, right? but the memory speed stays the same. What does that mean for us? It means that 20 years ago, the memory access may be 40 cycles, then it becomes 60 cycles, right? Processor cycles. Not because the memory becomes slower on its own, it's just the memory doesn't improve and the CPU with higher frequency and other improvements keeps going up. So the processor speed improving much higher than the memory speed and that creates a so-called memory wall because the latency becomes a huge issue. Caches that I show in the previous class is not a complete panacea, mostly because they cannot work in all cases. You need to have locality. Remember, temporal, spatial, locality. There are tricks to improve it. But just because I have cache, it doesn't guarantee me any utilization. I can write an application that had a random access through the big chunk of data and cache is completely useless, 
you already probably realize it, right? If there is no reuse, right? There is no hope to benefit from caches. So caches is just an optimization as most optimization doesn't work all the time. So essentially just relying on caches won't solve this problem. And people had this observation long time ago, even when caches were invented, it was still not a full blown solution. People know it, but remember back then in seventies, eighties, people didn't have uh, as big of a latency difference between processor and memory, right? It was tens of cycles. Now it's hundreds of cycles. So that's how big of a gap is. So right now it's more of a serious problem. So what are we gonna do to deal with that? We're gonna propose a new optimization called prefetching. And we're gonna discuss it uh, for several different data structures. We'll start with the arrays, right? And then we're gonna show you on some more complicated data structures like linked list. So the idea here is we had to admit that the latency is there. If we can cut it, we'll try to use it wisely. So we try to use the time when I'm waiting for the request, not to be completely wasted, but doing something useful. And essentially I'll show you how prefetching can do it. And we'll show you how it can be done in compiler. Remember prefetching can be done in purely in hardware or in purely in software or in a mixed style, software, hardware, car design. In this class, we're gonna focus mostly in software-based solutions, right? There are hardware-based solutions as well. They exist like your Intel processor or any other processor you have typically has prefetching already, or it's, although it's very limited compared to what we're gonna do in compiler. And we're gonna show you what kind of results we can get with it, okay? This is the plan for the beginning of today's uh, you know, presentation. So, how we are gonna try to deal with this humongous memory latency. So uh, essentially idea is there are several different techniques, right? Uh, that I mentioned. One is reducing the latency. So reducing the latency is locality optimizations, reorder iterations of the loop, improve cache reuse, something we covered last time, right? Hopefully you get a feeling of that. Locality optimizations, they either try to remove the accesses or like kind of reward things somewhat, somewhat in, uh, in a better way. But reducing the latency by avoiding memory, uh, extra memory accesses or cache misses is only one strategy. Another strategy is tolerating the latency. And this is prefetching. So essentially prefetching, the idea is move the data close to the processor before it is needed. So the idea is if I can somehow predict this data, this data would be needed soon, let's not wait until it's actually requested and let's bring this data early, right? It's a very high level idea, but that's conceptually what the prefetching is trying to do. So don't fetch when it's needed, prefetch it. So let me show you a timeline and this slide is very important. So if something is not clear on the slides, please ask. So I'll show you how we can tolerate latency through prefetching. And again, this is a very simplified version of what happens in real hardware, but hopefully it will give you a, a feeling of the idea. So let's look at the timeline where time goes from the top to bottom without prefetching of a few memory accesses. So let's say you execute for some time and then there is a load instruction happens. Remember the whole API, I'll just remind you, was memory, it's loads and stores, there's nothing else. Caches, prefetching, this is all optimizations. Your API as a user is loads and stores. There's nothing else. There would be some little feature here I'll show you later on, but pretty much loads and stores, nothing else. So if it's a load, if that load happened to miss in the cache, you would have to fetch the data from high level memory hierarchy. So from memory, for example, that rad period is when you're stalling waiting for, for data. If it would be a very primitive, uh, you know, single threaded, not pipeline design, you would literally don't do anything. You had the load, it needs data, you would just wait. Process a little bit smarter than that, but for simplicity, you can think that really nothing going on here. It's just fetching, right? So what's next? So after the data arrived, after some time, there's another instruction called load, right? Happens, that's load B. And when lucky again, there happens to be a miss again. So we're gonna fetch from memory. And then sometime later when the data arrives, 
we, we continue the execution. And remember this red area can be hundreds of cycles, right? So this is how the timeline executes without prefetching. This is the, uh, the baseline. What happens with prefetching? With prefetching, we had a special instructions or to be precise in software, we had a hint to the hardware, like we can't force hardware to do anything, but we can give it a hint generating a prefetch. So if we know that the low day is coming here, somehow we predicted that. Let's not talk about how, but to say I can know, I can detect this from the code. I don't wait here to start fetching the data. I inject the prefetch early in the trace, early enough, so by the time I need it here, it's already fetched. So what's gonna happen, memory has parallelism. So while I'm gonna execute instructions here, my data uh, request for memory is fetched and serviced. And by that time it's actually arrived. So when another piece needed, right? Like load B, say I can detect it at this point, I can also fetch it. So you see that because memory has a lot of parallelism in it, I can fetch multiple things in parallel. Luckily to a lot of memory bandwidth, I can do this in parallel. So what does it happen is that by the time I need this load, I already have it because it was fetched. By the time I need this load, this data is also fetched. So even though I actually still had this huge penalty here, if I somehow can overlap it with the main execution, right? And predict early which addresses are needed, I can bring it early. So I can create an impression such that those fetches are almost free for me. Remember, it's not really free. The data was fetched, bandwidth was consumed, but the latency and bandwidth are not two same things, right? So the bandwidth would be consumed here. In fact, there would be more, if I do mistakes, I can actually bring more data than it's needed. But the latency is not necessarily hurt. So very frequently students get confused between bandwidth and latency and think it's the same thing, it's just different metric. It's not, that's what I try to highlight you. So here the bandwidth is consumed, but the latency might not be a problem. So the key idea here is to overlap memory accesses with computation and other accesses so that that latency is not visible in the delay of your program execution. Questions? Uh, I have a question. Yes, go so, ahead. So, so you mentioned that um, every single single thread here, is that correct? For simple, in reality, it's not. For simplicity, you can think it is. Uh, one thing you might get confused when you think you had a single thread, you think you can't execute anything in parallel, but it's not the same thing because a lot of things, even in a single thread of execution can be asynchronous, right? So if I inject an instruction to prefetch, like say manually, right, in my code, uh, through compiler optimization, it make it run, but you don't need to wait until it happens. So prefetch instruction is non-blocking. It doesn't block your continuing execution because the thing, the difference between prefetch and load is that load need this data to continue execution. It needs to bring the data into the register. Prefetch doesn't store it in a register, right? There is no like prefetch just brings the data and stores in the cache, right? It doesn't bring it into any register. So you are, there are no dependency in between prefetch and anything else in the code. So you let the hardware do its magic, bring the data, while well, you can continue your single thread here. In reality, things are a bit more complicated. There can be parallel threads, but fundamentally there's no difference. Prefetching is useful even for a single thread. I just got confused at the point when um, you can fetch two, say, variables at the yeah. same time. Yeah. yeah. So think about it this way, think about it, Frank. There is, uh, like again, this is not computer architecture class, but just think about it. There is a thing called memory controller that deals with memory. That's a piece of hardware. That hardware works somewhat asynchronously from your CPU, right? The way it works, it gets something to service, like a memory request, and it sends those memory requests asynchronously from CPU because it doesn't depend from it. 
and it can send a lot of requests, tens, if not hundreds, in parallel, independently from CPU. Eventually, it can also be stalled because it has limited bandwidth. So this piece of hardware has its own pins to memory. It's somewhat synchronized with CPU. They all align at the right cycles. There's nothing can arrive at the half cycle, something like that. But otherwise, they operate independently. There's two independent agents. So hardware is very parallel in that sense, right? Very parallel. Oh. Even for a single thread execution. Things are more complicated. Again, there is also pipelining, right? Uh, there are all these different, and there, are, there can be helper threads and all this complexity that you can learn if you take computer architecture class. But I'm saying, even in the most simple case, hardware is parallel. So those patches are brought to you by hardware, right? And the key thing, the key difference that you need to understand that load A and prepatch A are different is because this is blocking. It needs to bring data in register. And until I have that data, I cannot finish the load. If it's a single threaded, no pipeline, there is nothing else I can execute, right? I have to wait to get this register to continue the execution. This thing tells me, please bring uh, print data from memory address A whenever there are spare cycles, right? And essentially, it's actually deprioritized by the memory hardware, right? By the memory control. So it brought it when there is a possibility, right? It's opportunistic. It doesn't block anything. I can generate prefetch, prefetch, and then real instruction. None of them are dependent on those prefetches, right? So they continue independently. So this is how we exploit parallels. Thank you very much. Okay, questions? Others? Guys, give me a signal that you are alive. <laughs> Do, can you still track me? Any questions? Okay. Okay, so this is a very basic idea. We'll go into details now. So what are the types of prefetching that exist? Well, it can be limited to, uh, you know, to uh, unit stride accesses um, or not limited. There are um, non-blocking loads, so it limits the ability to move back before the use. Uh, there can be hardware control prefetching. So um, the problem of ha hardware control prefetching it's, it's quite limited still to this day. It's limited to constant strides. So I didn't talk about how we predict addresses so far, right? This is kind of a miracle, right? For you, you just trust me that it can be done. We'll talk about it. Essentially, hardware control prefetching is very primitive because you don't see the data structure types. Remember, as a hardware, what you see, your ISA, your intermediate language, is assembly, right? That's what you see. In assembly, everything is compiled to register the instructions. So it's very hard to figure out what is what. So really in hardware, the best thing you can do, you, you just predict that something is going like, is a constant stride, like plus four, plus eight, plus 12, right? If you see a stream of accesses like that, you can predict that the next one is plus 16, right? So the hardware can handle prefetching of a very primitive form, right? But it cannot handle a very sophisticated, at least not in real hardware. In papers that people publish, it does, but in reality, it's not. Um, the benefit of hardware control prefetching is that they don't issue any extra instruction. So hardware inside of it figure out that something needs to be fetched, you need to generate an extra instruction. In software, I would have to put a prefetch instruction that's going to eat my issue bandwidth in the instruction. I would have a real instruction. In the hardware control prefetching, there's no extra instruction. It's going to directly send requests to memory control. So software control prefetching would have extra overhead of handling, but it doesn't need hardware changes and it has broader coverage because I can craft a smart algorithm to just my application that hardware would never recognize. Just before, say, I know my application is doing a linked list, right? I see and see that it's a linked list, so I can write a prefetching algorithm that would do that. While good luck hardware to figure out that something is a linked list, right? It's not a trivial task, okay? So that's a trade-off. Hardware does simple prefetching with very low overhead, but it's limited in what it can handle. Software can have a much broader coverage, but have higher overhead. That's a trade-off between the two. This is both software and hardware prefetching exist and sometimes coexist. 
Okay, so what are the profession goals? We need to find where we're applicable. Uh, and there is a trade off here. Remember, when I add prefetches, I need to be smart about it. If bandwidth would be free, I could just fetch all of my memory, right? What would it happen? Well, I would pollute my cache. I won't have enough space to keep all this data anyway, right? So I need to maximize the benefit by minimizing the overhead. So every time I fetch something, it's a speculative construction, right? I, speak to like, I speculatively expect that something would be useful. If I'm wrong, it's just an overhead, right? I just spend bandwidth for nothing. I burn power, you know, I spend some potential extra latency. So what I want is I try to limit my aggressiveness with the maximal benefit. So I try to have a trade off how aggressive I want to be fetch, right? And when I trust my predictors and things like that. So what are the key prefetching concepts? First, uh, when the prefetching possible. Possible only if addresses can be determined ahead of time, right? If it's completely random, prefetching won't work. There is a metric called coverage factor. This is simply the number of fraction of misses that are prefetched. So for example, if I had 100 misses before and prefetching was able to eliminate 50 of them, that's give me 50% coverage factor, 0 0.5, right? This is how many misses could cover, right? Avoid it, essentially. Um, unnecessary if data is already in the cache. So what does that mean? Well, I may fetch something that's already in the cache. What does that mean? I just wasted bandwidth, right? I fetch something that's already in there, right? So that's not useful. And that can happen as well. So I might bring something that was not there and is never used until it's evicted. So that's a waste. And there's also something called unnecessary, which I bring, but it's already there, right? So effective, if data is in the cache when later reference, that essentially try to avoid waste. And then there is analysis on what to prefetch, which try to maximize the coverage factor. So we can try to cover as many misses as possible while minimize the unnecessary prefetches. With prefetching, you had to assume that you're gonna make mistakes. It's not gonna be 100% accurate ever, right? Because you're gonna speculate and you might uh, make mistakes. Any, even the simplest prefetching that assumes a fixed right, it's very hard to prove that's what the next address is. You usually guess. So if you see uh, address plus four, plus eight, plus 12, plus 16, then natural guess that next one is plus 20, but you might be wrong. It might be you just access four and then you had a big jump, right? So no matter how uh, uh, conservative you are, you're gonna make mistakes, right? And because it's speculative, it's okay to make mistakes. As soon as usually your mistakes uh, overhead outweigh the benefits of what you cover, then still a good deal, okay? You see the difference with locality there, everything has to be precise. There, there's no like place for mistake, right? If you, you know, change things and you broke dependency or you, you had like locality issue, you had miss here, it's very complicated. So then there is a scheduling. We try to figure out when and how to schedule prefetches. So to maximize the effectiveness and minimize the overhead for, for, for prefetch. So here's some example of, um, you know, some benchmark, all the benchmarks that shows different heat rates in the last level cache. And you can see some benchmark has high heat rate, like 90%, and some something have very low, like 40%. So uh, those are heat rates for array accesses, right? Specifically in some of those benchmarks. And, uh, they might uh, actually reduce the, the pre, uh, you know, the prefetching overhead. So the important thing is to minimize the necessary prefetching. Okay, so let's look step by step on how we handle analysis and scheduling. So analysis tells us what to prefetch, and that's based on locality analysis, which go on the next slide. And then we're going to talk about scheduling, which is tells us how to issue prefetches, how to inject them in the code. I'll show you. That's based on loop splitting and software pipeline. Uh, you don't need to know the, the, you know, the optimizations. I'll show you later. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, let's look at locality analysis. Are you actually more or less familiar with that? Because locality analysis is the same as our old thing, like finding data reuse. Um, 
So essentially in data reuse, again, if caches were infinitely large, they would be finished. Um, so what we really need to do, because they're not infinite, we need to determine the localized iteration space, uh, set of inner loops where the data accessed by an iteration is expected to fit within the cache. This is how we deal with the finite capacity of the caches. And the way we find locality, we just have an intersection between reuse and localized iteration space. They take, you know, uh, cache capacity into account and that's the locality. And this is the example we've seen before. Remember of the spatial locality on this loop that has, uh, you know, going from I from zero to two and from G from zero to hundred. And uh, this is, you know, the accesses we had for A and, or A and B. Remember, we had a spatial locality for AIJ here, right? That's the easiest one. There is a temporal locality for B and J plus one here, right? And there is a group locality for BG zero because it benefits from something that goes ahead of it, right? So it's a group locality. So again, this is just repetition from a previous lecture. So we identify reuse as before, right? We essentially, uh, 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 convert our dependency problem into a linear, you know, system of equation where each axis is represented with uh, a matrix, right, plus an offset across uh, the different iterations variable. So something like I G becomes, you know, identity matrix, right? Then B G zero essentially becomes uh, zero zero one zero, right? So essentially this is uh, the matrix you need to multiply by ij to get that index, right? Exactly that. And this is the offset. This represents the constant offset. So like, for example, if here you have plus one in the first dimension, this is the plus one. So we already did it in the last class. This is matrix h that represents the index, right? And then the reuse naturally happens when those indices are equal, which brings us to removing all the constants and we essentially need to find a null space of matrix H, right? And this is the direction across which we go. So this is how we find uh, the locality, uh, what to prefetch, similarly to how we find the reuse. And this is again, just if you want some refresher, this is how we find temporal reuse, right? Uh, or for an example, like BJ plus one, um, zero. So if we just convert that, we would, it would be true whenever j1 equals j2, and that's regardless of i, which gives us, um, you know, the direction of span of one zero in the outer loop. Okay, so this is not new to you. This is the same reuse as before, prefetching just trying to utilize that math. And essentially, using this math, we can identify the prefetch predicate on when um to you know and what to prefetch so there can be several different types of predicates so first of all if there's no locality then miss happens every iteration and the predicate is true there's nothing you can do here if you had a temporal locality something like a first iteration for example then the predicate is something like i equals zero like remember for like the uh for a group locality for example uh, or temporal locality for the first iteration. Then spatial, like every L iterations, right, where L is the cache line size, you can have a maze because you brought a cache line, then you reuse everything within this cache line, and then you need to bring a new cache line with this data, right? For example, in array. That predicate is essentially written as I mod L, where L is the cache line size equals zero, right? That's a predicate, okay. So to make it a little bit more clear, let's look at this piece of code. We're gonna keep using it again and again for simplicity so you get used to it. What kind of locality is there and what is the predicate? For example, here the reference I, IJ has two dimensions. There is no locality across I dimension. There is locality across J dimension and that's spatial, right? So this is why the predicate along this dimension is true, means you don't need to write it because there's no need to do it and true, right? And along this dimension, we had spatial locality. And here we assume that the cache is tiny, so it's only cache line, 
is tiny, so it only feeds two elements, right, of an array for simplicity of the graph representation. Because of that, j is more two. We just assume that the cache line is eight bytes, right, and each value is four bytes, something like that. So this is the predicate for your prefetch, j more two equals zero. In this access, you had a temporal reuse across the i dimension and no reuse across the j dimension. So what you write here is i equals zero. That's your predicate, okay? So the first, first iteration of, of the book. Okay, this is how you essentially, for, for an array access, if you deal with uh, figuring out the predicates for prefetch. That tells you essentially what to prefetch, right? And the predicate for it. But that alone doesn't implement prefetching for you. So how do we gonna implement it? Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna use first a technique called loop splitting. So what loop splitting does, it decomposes the loops to isolate cache needs instances. This is a good idea because it's cheaper than inserting each state. So if you had a for loop where there's one unique instruct uh, iteration that needs to be handled specially. Instead of having an if statement that every iteration is gonna check, is it i equals 20, right? And then when i finally equals 20, you do something special. It actually tried to do this separately so that cost of if won't be paid. Remember, if is very costly, it, it becomes an extra instruction. It's a branch, so it, it might mean you make mistakes or predicting the outcome of the branch. And uh, if statements prevent a lot of optimizations to happen, right? It's instead of a single basic block, it becomes a control flow graph, right? It means that parallelism might not work, there might be dependency. So if you can avoid control flow, you should avoid control flow. That's the takeaway here. Okay. So if there are no locality, there's nothing to do with this predicate. If I had a temporal locality, like certain iteration looks special, what we do, we peel that loop. Iteration. What does it mean? We take that one um, iteration of the loop and do it separately. So it's the first iteration of the loop. I do that iteration first and then do all the other like 99 iterations separately, right? That's called loop peeling. It means I just peel out one instructions, in, uh, one iteration and do it separately. And for a spatial locality, we do something called loop unrolling uh, by a factor of L. And rolling of the loop is relatively simple optimization as well. What you do, instead of doing each loop iteration one by one, you actually take L iterations and do them all together. So you replicate the loop body like L times and then jump over that multiple times. That's called loop and roll, right? Okay. So we apply transformation recursively for nested loops and suppress transformation when loops become too large and the void goes explode. Remember, all of that is a good idea, except for the code keeps growing. That duplicates the loop body, right? This is loop decade, loop, uh, loop body L times. So it's not for free, right? It's, it goes into some other dimension, which is essentially code size. And if you hit the limit, if you start to miss in the, um, I cache, which stores the, the you know, the, the hot code of your code, you start to get a large penalty and then where it's not useful anymore, right? So that's the trade-off as usual. But that's, it takes time. You won't hit that limit with some small problems. Okay, let's look at software pipelining. So essentially the idea of software pipelining is to look certain number of iterations ahead and try to fetch the data just in time to when it's needed. But how we find when it's needed? Well, how ahead should we look? That's the heuristic that software pipelining uses. You just use, you go ahead in the number of iteration that is equal to uh, uh, L divided by S, where L is memory latency and S is the shortest path through loop body. So essentially what that does is you say, you know that your memory latency is 100 cycles and you know each iteration loop cannot be executed faster than 10 cycles. Why you need shortest? Because you can go 10 or 20, depending on which path you take in the control flow within a loop, right? You assuming the most aggressive version that you always take the shortest path. 
it means that data won't be needed. Uh, so if your shortest parse is 10 and memory is 100, you need to take at least 10 loop iterations until you reach the, the data that you're right now trying to fetch. And that tells you how far ahead you need to fetch, right? So you need to fetch not further than 10 iterations ahead. So that would allow you to avoid because uh, dividing by S is like the, uh, the most positive scenario. This is the fastest you can reach that point, but it might take longer. So let me look how it works in practice. So you had this simple original loop, right? Going from zero to 100. The software pipeline is going to break it into three pieces, right? First, it's going to, for example, we did the math and we figure out that that L by S is five. Just trust me, that's for simplicity, right? So it doesn't matter. It's some constant that we compute based on looking at this loop. Then, in the prologue, what we do, we start to fetch before the loop starts five first element of that array. Then we do the loop, but not for 100 iterations. We do it from zero to 95, right? And then I keep doing prefetching, but now I fetch five instruction ahead. So this is prolog, that's a steady state. So what does happen here? What happens here is because the distance needed iteration head is five, by the time, forget about prefetch here, this is a steady state. What happens here when I access A0, it's already in memory, right? Why? Because already executed this prolog that fetch A0, A1, A2, A3, A4, right? In advance. So by the time I see this guy, it's already in the memory. Right, already fetch it with my prolog. Is it clear to everyone? This is why I had a prolog. And as I execute loop iteration, I also keep prefetching, but not the next right instruction. I prefetch five in advance. So by the time, by the time I reach iteration six, right, I already had a six in here. Okay. And then there is an epilogue because he already prefetched by the iteration 95, already prefetched all the elements. It's 95 plus five, it's 100, already prefetched everything, right? So then epilogue is just execute the five last iteration of the loop, but without any prefetches because they already fetch everything needed. That's what it does. Essentially, what's the beauty of it? If I would do this thing here, what happened, I had a miss, then execute the loop, I had another miss, I execute the loop. What happens here? I would execute all five misses all together, right? In a very short loop. Remember here for simplicity, that loop has just AI. It can be a very large body of the loop here, right? So what I try to do when I know that that's a miss generator, that's what I'm doing for it. And this is the distance. So this is how software-based prefetching works with software pipeline, right? It pipelines the fetching with the actual execution. Guys, question, that's a basic idea. Anyone? Uh, so may I ask, ask a question? Of course. Why, um, so here you're fetch, fetching one, sort of, sort of like one array element at a time. Yes. I don't see how that's more useful, like, uh, things you can fetch like a multiple, probably a multiple elements at the same time to reduce your... Um, uh, prefetch instructions cannot fetch multiple, like it can only fetch one at a time. So right, like what happens, this loop will be actually converted into prefetch, prefetch, prefetch. This is not bad. Like you cannot do it any faster. Think about it. If I had a loop like that, it would be actually unrolled. So how it's going to look at the code is going to be Prefetch A0, prefetch A1, prefetch A2, prefetch A3, right? You can't do any better than that, right? Okay, I'm just um, having a little bit difficulty seeing how this um, can be more optimized than uh, the original loop. Since we're in each area, we're still fetching the data. 
we are we are fetching the data, but the data is all overlapped. Remember? Yes. One means one means one means. Imagine that in the original loop, again, for simplicity, I didn't show you all the other code. Assume there is another bunch of code here, right? That's not needed for prefetching. So what would happen here, are we gonna have a zero and miss? Then execute some code, then another miss, then another miss, then another miss. They would add up 100, 100, 100, 100, 500 cycles to my latency. Well, if I, I iterate them one by one, I'm gonna get, you know, one, another one, another one, another one, all overlapped. So I'm gonna maybe get 110 cycles of the total latency instead of 500. Do you see the difference? The number of misses is identical, but how they served is different. In one case, they all happen one by one, so they overlap nicely. In the other case, they're not overlapped, right? So that's where the difference is. Okay. Yeah. But the thing is, I cannot just prefetch one iteration in advance. I cannot do prefetch. Like the first mistakes that students usually do when they try to prefetch, they try to do prefetch address A of AI and then have AI equals zero. Well, it's too late. You just prefetch it and you had the, the demand access. You didn't save anything, right? You need to prefetch in advance, right? And that's how fine advance you need to go based on this map here, right? So we detect how far you want to go. Sometimes you don't know that LNS precisely, so you have that as a tunable parameter in your experiment, right? But the idea is still the same, right? You try to figure out how far you want to go. Is this clear? No? Frank? Yes, I, I, I guess so. I'm just, uh, so I think prefetching is kind of like, uh, have to think of as a memory op operation rather than a CPU operation. It is a memory operation, yes. So as a CPU operation, that, I mean, it has an instruction to represent it, but it's asynchronous. That's the thing you need to realize. So the law, it's not, it's not blocking, but the load is blocking. So you call the load, everything stalls and wait for load. If you call prefetching, the world doesn't stop, it continues, right? So when you execute AI here, right? It's gonna stop the world and wait until the address arrives so I can store zero in it, right? Then I go back, check my eye and go do another load. They're gonna be one, Another one, another one, another one, right? Here I said, bring me data and continue. Bring me data and continue. So the offset is maybe one cycle between each of them, right? So they're gonna be very nicely overlapped. In the other case, it won't. Just because the memory has this parallelism in it. Okay, any questions? Okay. So since we're out of time for this part, let's have a short break here and I'll see you in roughly 10 minutes. And please ask questions. Thank you guys, see you in 10 minutes.
Okay, guys, let's return back to class. Okay, so I guess everyone is back. So that was a very simple case of a single level loop, right? Obviously, things can become more complicated where you had multiple levels of the loop and multiple different accesses. So the way we handle it is we handle them one at a time. For example, here we have these two accesses that generate misses. Remember, this one doesn't need anything, right? Because that has no locality. So we had spatial locality for one and temporal locality for another one. So how do we handle that? So you can see here there is a special loop, right, that goes from uh, zero to six with a step two that does prefetching for uh, essentially BJ plus one, right? And I do two prefetches at a time because I get G plus two, right? So I get two at a time. And I'm also doing prefetching for this guy, right? So because that does need to, uh, you know, prefetch everything. So that's uh, according with the distance and the, you see, I don't need to prefetch everything because every other iteration is brought to the cache due to the spatial locality. So if you got confused, think about it this way. And when I bring A00, that brings A00 and A01 into the cache at the same time. So I don't need to have prefetch A00 and A01 only need to prefetch every other iteration. Because of that, done with proper math, I identified how many I want to prefetch here. So I prefetch A00, then here I'm gonna prefetch A, uh, what do it be if I uh, do uh, J equal zero here, so it's gonna be A03, right? And so on. So I try to prefetch, uh, you know, with a step of two, so I don't prefetch anything unneeded, okay? And so that I don't generate an extra useless loop, I try to mix these prefetches for the, for the blue accesses with the prefetches for the green accesses, which is a temporal peeling optimization for BJ. And because here the iteration is over two, I do unrolling and I do two iterations at a time. So I could have have a separate loop for green that would go and prefetch every iteration, right? But that would be very wasteful, right? So I place this all together in one loop. Okay, this is a you know prologue part. Okay. Then here there is another part that has essentially there the peeled loop iteration. So it essentially has, uh, uh, it, it, it becomes, uh, how would I put it? So it does an extra uh, prefetches for BG, but you see it's doing everything with step two, right? So essentially what I did, I did loop, remember when I did so software pipelining, I said I do unrolling. So unrolling essentially starts to iterate over two and the step and then rolling. For simplicity, again, I assume that the step two is good enough. So it won't be less confusing for you. If it would be 10, that would be replicated 10 times, right? So because of that, this here is twice, but this is only needed to be once, right? Because it's only every other thing that causes the miss. Uh, and uh, then there is this piece of code, right, that uh, finishes, uh, you know, uh, the tail of the execution, the last whatever, six iterations. And then you had, uh, you see what I did right here? So I first take the iteration i equals zero and peel it out, right? So this thing was everything but just for one iteration of the outer loop for i equals zero. This is why it's zero, 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 zero here, you see, right? Because uh, uh, this is the peeling 
for the one iteration of the outer loop because that locality is only happens for the first iteration of the loop. So the green stuff is only in that iteration and it prefetches everything needed for all three iterations, right? Whatever is there, three iterations, right? Then I repeat the same story as before, but now essentially I don't need to worry about BJ anymore. It's all locality and prefetching happened here in the field iterations. And I do this thing. So this is exactly like that, but without the green stuff, right? So, but it goes, it has one outer loop from, uh, from I one to three. And then you do pretty much similar stuff as here, but just for, you know, for A, right? And it's also unrolled. So, then you had another prologue, another main body, and another epilogue, right? So this is how we deal with two-level nested loop. We peel one level and do all the magic for that iteration, and then we had the rest, and we do all the magic for that iteration. So as you can see, it can look quite complicated, right? After actually exit. But fundamentally, it all boils down to these few simple things, like uh, I described here. It's peeling and unrolling. There's not a, nothing other than that. Any questions? We won't ask you to implement this in the code, but you want to we want you to understand how it's done. Because you're gonna see compiler doing that. Questions? Okay, no let's if there are no questions, I've just summarized this again. You see, this is i equals zero. This is i bigger than zero, right? This is your special uh, uh, locality. And this is within that iteration, you can still do unrolling, right? For the other thing. And this is i bigger than zero. Okay, so we just uh, look at dealing with arrays but where all the indices are nice and clear, there is a precise math for I and J and everything is easy. Things are not that easy in the real life. There is a so-called indirections. So you can have something like array A where indices are actually coming from another array. Imagine that someone do a random permutation of something, right? And then you want to sum up of the elements of that. It's very common operation. Well, these things won't allow me to do anything nice as I just did, right? because I don't know the precise indices of what I want to do. Is it hopeless or not? Well, the good thing, even in this case, is I can do something useful. So what we're gonna handle right now, we're gonna uh, deal with indirect references. It's very difficult to predict where the indirections hit or miss. Uh, so we need to do some modification of software pipeline and algorithm to handle that. So let's again, I make this loops trivially simple. Remember that loop body might have a lot of other stuff here, right? But just focusing on what matters. And assuming we want to prefetch five iterations in advance, what we're gonna do in the steady state, we're gonna do prefetch of the index first and then prefetch of array of that index, but from a previous five iterations. How does that work? Let me explain. It looks really complicated, but it's not like that. Think about it. First, when I want to deal with that array, to get me A of something, I need to have that index. But that index itself can miss in the cache, right? Because it comes from an array itself. So the way I deal with it, as you in five iterations in advance, I first prefetch prolog one. I first prefetch the five indices right? Similarly as before, as if that would be the only array here, right? Then in the next loop, I gonna keep prefetching the next six to 10th indices from index array. But now I also start to prefetching the first five elements of array A, because for them indexes were prefetched in prolog one. Are you guys with me? So is it still clear? Then in the steady state, I'm going to run 0 to 90, not to 100, not to 95, where the indices go 10 iterations in advance. The prefetch for array A itself is going to be five iterations in advance. 
and the, the actual loop body is going to get in the nor uh, normal flavor and it's only going to get the first 90 of that. By the, by the time the steady state is over, all these indexes are fetched, they go up until 100. 95 of those things are fetched and 90 of the real execution is over. So I need to finish my epilogue. So in the epilogue one, I prefetch the last five elements of array A, right? And those indexes already here because we got them here, right? And then I get the, uh, the pre-last five elements of the sum. And then in the last index, everything is already prefetched. So the only thing I need to do is add up five things. So it just gets more complicated, but that's from the compiler perspective, from the execution on the CPU perspective, this is much better than the original code, right? Everything can be perfectly fetched, right? So you see, even though the interaction adds complexity and it's not as easy to handle, as I think is actually non, uh, it, it is possible, right? So this is essentially what compiler has to generate. When I say software pipelining, you can write this by hand, the compiler can generate this code as well, right? So this is how things can be optimized. Questions? I hope it's not, I try to simplify this to death. So this is as simple as it can look, right? So you get the feeling, right, of what it is. So essentially you just get, if you had multiple levels of interactions, you just get more prologues and more epilogues. And you just feel it like one, one step at a time, starting from the inner index, right? So you can handle this way any number of interactions, right? Okay. Okay, so in summary, uh, I'll just give you some reference to the results people were able to get on some benchmarks. They were able to eliminate with this type of optimizations 50 to 90% of all the memory stalls, which is quite impressive, right? Overhead, overheads remain low due to prefetching selectively and significant improvements in overall performance in six benchmarks, uh, it was over 59%. And that's for dense matrix code, for indirection, sparse matrix code, is expanded coverage to handle some important cases. So essentially the message here is when people propose these ideas at end of 90s, beginning of 2000s, that was state of the art in compiler optimization and it helped in a lot of real applications, right? So that was not just a research paper, that was actually practical, okay? This software pipeline is like a standard optimization now since in 20 years. Okay. So the concluding remarks, that we only handle arrays so far. We demonstrated that software prefetching is effective. So we can be selective to eliminate overhead. We can deal with dense matrices and indirections. Uh, it's helpful actually for both uniprocessors and multiprocessors. Uh, and essentially the hardware from the perspective of this paper was trying to the responsibility of hardware was to provide sufficient memory bandwidth. So we can handle the complexity of prefetching and what to do. Hardware give me enough bandwidth. People improve since then. They improve their hardware prefetching. They build software hardware co-designs and other things. But the key message is clear. Soft hardware should do what it can do well, which is a simple prefetching, right? Uh, and uh, provide enough bandwidth and the uh, and the hard, uh, so hardware does hardware prefetching and software can generate much more complicated code. But as you can see, what we did here, it's almost impossible to do it in hardware, right? Hardware would be very difficult to figure out these multi-level interactions, right? And loop iterations and everything, right? So that's better to be done in software. Okay, any questions? So, that one hour, roughly a little bit more than one hour, we covered the arrays, the one of the most common. We covered ba uh, baseline arrays and also interactions, right? So the question is how we can deal with other stuff. Other stuff includes our favorite data structure, uh, data structures, link list, trees, graphs. They're very popular. There are a lot of algorithms uh, on graphs. And uh, this is a very common method of building large data structures, especially for non-numeric programs. So they're big enough. If you ask me why we're handling that special case, well, because this special case is very common, right? So it is important to handle it. 
cache miss is, uh, is a concern there because you had to deal with really large data set with respect to the cache size. I remember back even in 2013, I gave a talk at Oracle Labs and they told me that they deal with some graphs that had uh, billions of nodes and tens of billions of edges, right? That's the graph size they deal back like 80 years ago. So those data structures are humongous. They don't fit in any cache, right? So you had to deal with memory and memory latencies. Um, temporal locality may be poor. I can jump across this graph in quite random way, depending on my uh, algorithm. And it has very uh, had very poor temporal locality. It had very little spatial locality among consecutive nodes. Think about the tree, right? There, when I parse the tree, the way I allocate the data, where how I access the data is, has nothing to do with each other and spatial reuse is minimal, right? In, in general case, right? So I don't really know from there. It's not like an array where if I go sequentially, I know everything is nicely allocated, right? In tree, it's not like that. So essentially people uh, uh, state this challenge a long time ago, trying to build an automatic compiler-based prefetching for recursive data structures, okay? And I'll give a short overview. I'll talk about the challenges in prefetching recursive data structures. I'll give you a few algorithms that people try to do, the simplest I know. And I'll show you some experimental results right on that topic. Okay. So what is so challenging about prefetching for recursive data structures? So essentially think about that I had a linked list. That's the easiest structure I can think of, the, uh, say, of uh, that you had a pointer P, right? That has next field, like in typical link list and the data field, right? And the way you access the data in the timeline, you essentially, you're currently in this node and I, then you work on the data of that node, right? And then you access the next element by doing P equals P next, right? This is the basic way with how we manipulate link list, right? So essentially I had working on this element then working on that element then on that elements. So the idea is that for me, the benefit from prefetching, I want to fetch something that is here, right? Several iterations in advance. Remember similarly to loops. With the loops, I really know where it is, right? Because I could just take, you know, plus three iterations and loop indices and fetch that ahead. But here, the problem, I don't know these guys before I see this guy. And I don't, don't know these guys until I see this guy, right? So they all had a chain dependence. The problem for us is that the work might be small and the load of the node might take a lot of time when we access the data here, right? So we had work that is, you know, blue, purple, and we had a load here that loads this data with the first time you access this data, it might cause a cache miss. So our goal is to fully hide the latency of the load that's achieving the fastest possible computation rate of one over W. So if that load would disappear, the best thing I can do is I would just spend the latency of a W on each computation. So my rate of computation would be at one over W. If I don't do that, it would be more like one over L, which is much longer than W, okay? So let's, for example, uh, assume that the latency of loading a node is taken three times of working on the node. And it's not impossible. The work can be a simple function that do a few manipulations and load is a memory accessed at hundreds of cycles, right? So if this is 100 and this is 30, this is exactly the rate one to three, right? So this is not an impossible situation. So if we had roughly this rate, we must prefetch three nodes ahead to achieve this thing, right? So what if I had this naive code here? How is it gonna work? Well, that's essentially what's gonna happen. I'm gonna load P data first, then I do the work on it. Then I'm gonna load the next thing and then I'm gonna work on it and so on and so on. So essentially the computation rate here would be one divided by L plus W, right? That's my computation rate, okay? Because uh, I mean, we want to get the highest possible, uh, you know, computation rate, uh, obviously, okay? So 
what if I prefetch one node in advance? So prefetch is just uh, sort of the different syntax, but PF stands for prefetch, the same thing, right? So PF of P next. So if I'm an advance and I know I want to read things in advance, let me try to prefetch one element in advance. What does it gonna give me? It's gonna give me that element one step in advance, right? So, but what's the problem here? The problem is that even though computation is now overlap with memory accesses, it's not overlap as amazingly, right? It only overlap, a computation rate improve. It's now one over L, right? Which remember L is equals three W. So this is one over three W before it was one over four W, right? But it's by no means is one over W, right? It's still three X worse than one wanted to be. Well, maybe we need to prefetch two steps in advance or three steps in advance. The problem, it doesn't happen. It doesn't help much. So that's what's going to happen. Even if I prefetch next, 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 the problem is they all depend on each other this way, right? They all, I'm going to handle the first miss, then the second miss, then the next miss, and then the next miss, right? Until I dereference that structure, I don't really have access to it. So it's not that like, they will be as array elements nicely overlap, right? They all dependent on each other because until this data arrives, I can't really go to the next field and to the next field, right? So here prefetching doesn't break the, the semantics issue because there's a dependency. Even though this is a prefetch, I can't really do anything until this data arrives, right? So I prefetch it in advance, but so what? So the thing is, no matter how further I try to prefetch in this case, my computation rate is still one over L and it doesn't improve at all. So the trick that works for arrays doesn't work for those uh, you know, recursive data structures. This has a name in the literature, it's called pointer chasing problem. Any scheme which follow the pointer chain is limited to a rate of one over L and that's fundamental and you're not gonna break that. So if you follow a pointer chain, that's the, the best rate you can get. So, but our goal was to fully hide the latency, right? So can we do something about that? Well, one thing you can think about what you really want, you want to prefetch this guy, right? So what's something I want to do is one prefetch address of not next, next field. I want to prefetch the element N itself without chasing the next pointers. I want to know this guy Similar to array, remember when I say A plus five, right? I knew it because I know where it's located in memory. Here, I don't know it because I need to go through the next pointer, but if I magically can do it, that would give me a rate of one over W, right? That's the rate I want. So the question is, how can I figure out that NI plus three, right? Without actually chasing the pointers. So we're gonna look at three algorithms, greedy history point prefetching and data linearization prefetching. So the key here is like, that's something I really want you to remember is an I needs to know the element address of N I plus D, right? Where D uh, without reference intermediate values. That's the key idea how we want to handle point and chase problem. And every iterations I want to see D steps in advance. And there are three different ideas, basic ideas that I'm gonna present to you now uh, to get a glimpse of what people invented. One is a greedy, uh, greedy prefetching. So what greedy prefetching is trying is trying to look at that pointer and say, you know what? By just looking at you guy, I can figure out what that might look like. And I'm gonna aggressively prefetch around that area so that hopefully I hit it, right? And if I'm lucky, I just brought you the data, right? It's gonna be speculative as all prefetching, but it's gonna to try to guess from that pointer, the pointer, uh, the pointer D iterations in advance. Another idea is to add a new pointer to an I to approximate that one. So that's a history pointer prefetching. So I'm trying to keep some history with the pointer. So the first time I see it, I store some information. Next time I see it, I had some history that I can use to predict. So I'm not just wildly guess. I'm actually gonna learn from history of executions. Um, 
And um, so then we're also going to do, uh, you know, some compute and, uh, you know, and directly access an I for, with no point in referencing. Okay, let me show you the greedy prefetching first. So we prefetch all neighboring nodes, right, in a very simplified definitions. So only one will be followed by the immediate control flow and hopefully we'll visit other neighbors later. So essentially what happens here, so if you had a tree like that, that you parse. So uh, before you process, you always access prefetch left and right, chunk both of them, right? Before you go for processing the data and you hope that you uh, guess it correctly. So essentially I trying to guess where I'm going before going there uh, and uh, hopefully that branch will be taken. So I'm gonna take along the leaves that's useful. So the first time I'm go here, that's a miss. There is nothing else I can do, right? Then in node two, because when I'm in one and two, uh, um, I'm gonna get prefetch left and prefetch right. Then just follow me, see, this is a partial miss, why? Because I get left, then I process the data and I start to, you know, pre-order T left, pre-order left. So the next thing I do, I'm gonna handle the left one. You see that access to T left is a little bit close to that request. This is, means it's partial miss. So I prefetch it, but not too early, right? So that means it's still mostly miss, but not completely. What it means in the perfect, uh, in the perfect heat, the data fully arrived by the time I need it, right? Remember how I did it. I just picked the right distance. Here I cannot get that perfectly. So what happens here, I happen to have that miss early, but not too early. So by the time I call T left here, the data still didn't arrive, right? But maybe instead of waiting 100 cycles, I'm gonna wait 20, uh, 80 cycles or something, right? This process T data, say it's one third of memory access latency. It means by the time I came here, I already spent 30 something cycles, right? So it means here, I'm not gonna wait the whole 100 cycles. I'm gonna only wait like 70 extra cycles, okay? That's what's called partial miss. It's still a miss, but I don't wait the full latency, right? Because my data is already coming to me. It just didn't arrive. It's like, you know, uh, someone wants to order pizza, but someone already in the household ordered the pizza. So that's like a partial miss, right? You're, you are not gonna send the second request because it's already in transfer. But one thing I want to highlight that for two, it's a partial miss. But after I figure out blah, 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 this thing, eventually I'm gonna come back to number three. And because that took like, you know, you can do the math say the, the processing was taking 30 cycles, this is 130, 30, 30, 30. So by the time I arrived here, that prefetch right already arrived, right? So this is gonna be a perfect hit. You see it, right? So I prefetch left and right. And if I'm lucky, that thing's still in the cache, right? So I'm just greedy. I'm grabbing the both thing. By the time I reach this same here, when I get to number two, right? I'm gonna get here four. And five was gonna happen. And by the time I write from here, five is ready. So this is the basic idea you see, right? So I'm, it's called greedy because I'm grabbing everything left and right or everything I can, right? Everything that looks like a right point or that might be useful, let's prefetch it, right? It might be the case that my algorithm would never access that. That means I will pollute the cache, bring some useless stuff, but it's not that bad. So the reason people use it, it's quite effective in practice. Like usually when people traverse the tree, they traverse most of it. So usually those, uh, you know, accesses are not completely wasteful. Some of them are actually useful, but you had very little control over the prefetching distance. What does that mean? Well, here it might have taken 300 cycles until I reach here. Here it might be 50, here's might be 70. I literally have no control of how far it's gonna happen. So I might easily pollute the cache or not being aggressive enough. So I have a very little control of what's going on. Okay, does it make sense? So it's essentially more like by life, depending on the structure of the tree, I might ended up then being a hit. If I'm really very deep tree, 
it might happen that this thing is already evicted. There's not enough space and cash. So by the time I came here, that's already evicted, right? So it's really by luck, right? So I'm gonna get some overlap, obviously. So I'm trying, I'm gonna try to reuse some of their structure, but for a very deep tree, it might be not that useful. Another more sophisticated thing, then again, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna get for, uh, for too long, but essentially the idea is that instead of uh, going by luck, like in the previous example, we add a new pointer to each node that uh, that store some recent information on what was accessed afterward, right? So think about it as I try to track your recent history and because I know where you go in on recent traversals, I know what might happen next to you. Because of that, because I keep there certain queue of what was accessed one by one, like here I can have certain queue, I can have this history pointer telling me that after accessing 10, within certain distance, I'm gonna need, you know, uh, number six and so on. So essentially it, uh, that history pointer prefetching has an extra cost. It's gonna add an extra pointer to every data structure element. But the good thing about it, if your traversals are more or less similar over the time and your graph doesn't change, like you don't reshuffle all the graph all the time, it means you actually, there is actually a distance. So even though the tree looks so we weird, if you say doing always depth first or uh, you know width first, right? Uh, uh, you always had, if you would look at how things executed in time, there is actually some linear order, right? Because this, even though it's a tree based, if you look at how it's accessed, it's actually in certain order. If you magically have this order, which that history point try to approximate for you, you would know that after six, 10 iterations later is 10 and so on, right? You would know that order. So that history point of prefetcher trying to collect that order from the history of the previous iterations, right? It's trying to add extra, so it's a trade-off. You try to essentially uh, get better control over prefetching distances, right? You don't want to randomly guess which further pointer you need. You really know that for each of this pointer, you know what would be four iterations in advance bent on the previous list, because the way you deal with this, you had this history pointers, and as you traverse the tree, you know what, after 10, six iterations later, uh, I've seen say six. So let me update the pointer, history pointer here to this one, right? And so on. And if my traversal, so it works if the traversal is similar over time somewhat, right? That's common in many cases. But as you can see, this thing has a trade-off. I would need to store an extra memory, right? For every data element, because I need for every pointer node, I would need to store an extra history pointer. It's an overhead. You're getting better uh, control with prefetching distances. It will just uh, cost you some space and time for that. Uh, but uh, uh, it might be acceptable if your nodes are really huge. So an extra pointer is not a big deal. If you had a struct that has like hundreds of bytes of different elements there, then an extra pointer of eight bytes or four bytes is not a big deal, right? Does it make sense, guys? Did you get the high level idea? Again, this is the graph here to just visualize it for you, right? Uh, so essentially we had, as we traversed the tree, we, we had this little queue first in, first out, right? As we move. And when we reach this point, we just, you know, add everyone that pointer back. So you know where you are in the future. So for example, I go 12 and then six and then three, 11, 10. But by the time I get to 10, I go back and say, you know what? you are three step away from me, right? So I update your history. That's how it's implemented, okay? Frank, question? So uh, so this will be only useful if you are traversing the data structure, say at least twice, is that true? Absolutely correct. So that's assumed they do it frequently. 
And even though it's a, a restriction, it actually not surprised. Like, I mean, think you're in Facebook, right? Well, <laughs> that's the graph you're gonna traverse many times. And yes, that graph changes, but you know what? It doesn't like not all the billion nodes changes all the time, right? So, and their edges, which is France, doesn't change as dramatically all the time either, right? So it's not a, it's a, not a bogus assumption, right? It's an assumption that can be quite realistic, right? Uh, so it, it's not general, general, but it, it is some cases where it's useful, okay. And the next improvement over that is data randomization prefetch. So what this thing does, remember before I said that what we were doing with history, we kind of trying to add virtually that plus three into everywhere, right? So that every node, that instead of doing that, you can, and having the history point, you can actually try to linearize your tree. So you try to store it in an array-like fashion, depending on the traversal explicitly, right? So if you go one, two, four, eight, nine, five, that's how you store it. One, two, four, eight, nine, five, 10, one, three, and so on. What's the beauty of that? If you can map nodes are close in the traversal to the contiguous memory, I'm back to my array, right? It's essentially look like an array now, right? So if I can actually convert it into this linear form, that would allow me to prefetch it much more efficiently, okay? And why is it better than the previous approach? There are no need to store pointers, right? There are no need to do dereferences, right? Everything is explicit. So the previous thing, try to have this history pointer, but it makes them explicit. This and say, well, you don't need to actually store them, just make it linear, right? If it's so stable, make it an array essentially, linearize it. Let's call it data linearization prefetch. Okay, doesn't make sense. So again, those things implementation wise are quite heavy, right? That's more like a more advanced techniques, but I'm just trying to show you what conceptually they're doing. There are a lot of other tricks that people do for prefetching that I'm not covering here. One thing, the most crazy one I've seen is every time you read something from memory, you look at it and say, hmm, does that eight byte look a pointer to me? If it looks like a pointer, it has all the prefaces and all the, you know, like, you can easily distinguish when you debug code, you know what the pointers look like, right? They know they're coming, what comes from the stack versus what coming from, uh, you know, from the memory allocated stuff from my lock. And then you say like, well, maybe I'll just keep prefetching everything that looks like a pointer, right? Because if it's a pointer, then probably it would be needed to someone with some reasonable assumptions that can make it work. So if I can do anything else that I'll just bring everything that looks like a pointer right? Because usually people, if your code generates some pointer, it's usually for one reason, that later on you're going to read something from that pointer. And even that exists. And people build this even in hardware, like prototypes. Okay, so this table is no new information, just a summary of what we've just seen, right? So I show you a greedy history pointer prefetching and data linearization. So the greedy one has uh, uh, little control over the distance, right? It's just by like, depending on how you parse the structure. History point and data organization are definitely more precise. Greedy though is a very generic, it works on any recursive data structures, right? You can always guess, there's no harm. History pointer only works when the, the traversal and the graph is revisited and that the graph itself changes very slowly over time. Um, the data linearization is even more restricted. It's not only has to be revisited, it has to have the dominant major traversal order. Why is that important? Like in the previous one, you can have two different traversal order and adjust to them. Here, you're gonna really linearize the data structure. You're not gonna keep reshuffling all the data all the, data all the time, right? It's too costly, right? So you're only gonna do it if you had a measure traversal order and the same, it has to change on, uh, slowly. Uh, so how about overhead? Greedy has no overhead, right? You just guess, so this is just a regular prefetching. Here, there is no space, there, here there's a space and time overhead. I need to add extra pointers. It's extra memory and an extra time to reference that memory, right? So 
In the worst case, it can be like you know, 20, 30% overhead. If you just have a linked list with like, or a tree that has a data left, right, and then you add another pointer to that node, it's 25% memory overhead, right, at least, right? And it's an extra work, so it can be significant. That organization that has some uh, preparational overhead, but after that, there's no overhead, right? It's linear, it becomes like an array after that. Um, implementation for greed is relatively straightforward. Uh, uh, this is more difficult and this is even more difficult than that one because that requires the whole data reshuffle. Yeah, this is more like you just need to update the pointers. Here you need to reshuffle the whole organization. Okay, so in summary for the for the last more or less hour, we look at three different schemes to overcome pointer chasing problem. I hope after this class you understand what the pointer chasing problem is, right? How it comes. That the fundamental, if you're chasing the pointers, the trick that works for arrays doesn't work here. So I need somehow to guess like several steps in advance what the object I need. I cannot follow the next pointer because it's not gonna bring me anywhere. So we look at three techniques, greedy prefetching. They just try to guess what would be useful soon, but without contro any control over the distance of that. Then we have a history pointer prefetching that asks us to store some extra metadata as you traverse the data. And assuming that traversals are similar over time, then you can reuse the information you collect in the history. And there is a data linearization prefetching that make that history idea to the next level. And instead of keeping the distance in the metadata make and linearize the whole data structure that would make it look like an array. So the previous ideas that we use for arrays would work. Um, that was actually implemented in several commercial uh, compilers like Stanford Swift and uh, was used uh, on like different benchmarks. Okay, that's everything I have for today. So that was that content today, if you want for reference, that was not state of the art, but nearly state of the art. That's something that was invented the last well, 15 years ago or so, right? So those algorithms are still quite challenging, uh, but not too challenging so they can actually describe in the undergrad class, right? If you want to learn more, there are plenty of recent works on prefetching. Please explore on your own if you're interested. Okay, any questions? Okay. Okay, if there are no questions, then thank you guys. Um, um, I think there was a question about A2 uh, results. Bojan posted an answer to that. So hopefully within a week, you get your assignment to back. If you're really uh, worried about something, want to know your results early, just being directed to Bojan, uh, just send an email directly to Bojan, right? To learn about it. And reminder to everyone, there's no class on April 5th, so two weeks from now. So does that mean the next week will be our last lecture? Uh, I think when I look at the calendar, April 15th said it's the last day of class. I'm not sure whether April 15th would be a class or not. Does anyone know? Like because in the calendar it says April 12th, that's the last day of class. Okay, I'll figure it out and, and let you know, right? So we definitely have lecture after that, uh, uh, and uh, I'll uh, I'll chat with Bojan. We'll figure out. I think the schedule says it's April twelfth, so I was hoping that April twelfth there's still a lecture. If not, we'll come up with something. Okay, okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.